Cities are the drivers of the nation's growth in terms of employment and the economy. But while we think of cities geographically in that they are constantly evolving, we also need to consider the environmental impact of cities on a larger scale. Cities and towns can spearhead innovations to bridge the inequality gap, deliver climate action, and ensure a green and inclusive future for all. For that, we need to rethink the manner in which we look at our cities. We need to make them resilient. Hello, I am Kaustub Rao, and I have with me Seema Mundoli, faculty at Azim Premji University, to talk about resilient cities. So Seema, let's start with conflict. We always have conflict in our lives, but we also hear about uh, human nature conflict, especially outside urban spaces. But do we also have conflict of that kind inside urban spaces? Yes, definitely. So uh, cities are places with a lot of conflict. But uh, one thing uh, I would like to start by saying is that we have to stop thinking in terms of the binaries anymore of development and environment when we think about conflicts. Uh, because uh, nature, nature in cities has a lot to offer in terms of solutions for urban sustainability challenges or resilience what we're talking about. So for example, uh, so many of the problems about urban uh, uh, sustainability like whether it is waste management, water scarcity, flooding, this can all actually be addressed if we incorporate nature into the solutions. So to give, an, to give let's take wetlands in cities as an example, we have uh, wetlands that can perform the functions of water purification and uh, wetlands as large as the East Kolkata wetlands in fact perform multiple functions. That mosaic of land and water which is extremely beautiful also supports a lot of livelihoods of local communities. Uh, it uh, also is an important ecological uh, space as a lot of the functions such as water purification, flood mitigation is done by the wetlands. And in addition to it, these are the, uh, they act as the sewage treatment plant of, for the city of Calcutta. And one thing we have been doing some research and interviews there and people also relate to the uh, wetland in a very uh, personal way. So uh, or if we incorporate all this, then our very idea about wetlands will change. Right. So as opposed to seeing it as uh, land for real estate and yeah. only for development of a particular kind, they can also provide a lot of solutions, what we call as nature-based solutions for uh, urban uh, sustainability challenges that every city almost faces. And this is true for wetlands in any kind of uh, city in uh, India. Yeah, it's interesting that you should mention wetlands because I just found out that there are seven cities in India, in India that like to call themselves lake cities. So obviously we ascribe a lot of importance to these wetlands and I'm guessing we should do a lot more to preserve them. Yes. The other thing we associate with cities is jobs and employment and guarantees of employment. So where does the environment uh, fit into all this? See, one thing maybe that we have very little of nowadays is an imagination for our cities. So we think of cities only from an economic or an employment generation point of view. But there is actually the opportunity for convergence of employment, economy, as well as the environment. Uh, if you're looking at some of the most uh, vulnerable populations in, in a city, uh, one of the things that we have also trying to explore has been the role of green jobs in urban employment guarantee schemes. Uh, we've heard of NREGA, it's equivalent yeah. in the rural areas. And post-COVID, many states have started uh, many employment guarantee schemes. But uh, how can we bring in the elements of nature, nature that can actually build resilience of local people, as well as the city as a whole, yeah. into these jobs? Uh, we have some examples uh, from the urban guarantee scheme in Kerala and uh, so uh, how can uh, say uh, a vegetable garden that is grown by local uh, people in plots of land in their localities, how can it contribute to food security or how can uh, cleaning of canals, maintaining water bodies help to uh, move away from the cycle of drought and floods that almost all cities face. Yeah. So Kerala during the 2018-19 floods which were really m massive, yeah. uh, after it they realized that you know there's a lot of scope uh, for uh, cleaning of canals and uh, water bodies to mitigate the impacts of the floods. And you're, you're performing so many services, nature is giving you so many services, it's contributing to food supply, it's helping make the cities better places to live in because so much of the population of this country and across the world is going to be living in cities. So Absolutely. employment, the three E's, employment, economy and environment definitely can go together in uh, cities.
Yeah, I mean that's really good to know. And if you think about cities and our, our most Indian cities are kind of accelerating in terms of their coverage uh, at a really fast pace. So how do uh, we deal with the border of the city and the rural, where the city meets, uh, as they say, the peri-urban? What impact do cities have on those areas? The peri-urban interface, that ring around the cities, is a very dystopian kind of a space. Yes. Uh, it is rural and urban at the same time. So there are there is a rural population as well as there are rural processes. There is also an urban population and urban processes happening. So inevitably what happens is it falls through the crack of governance. And you have governance systems that are geared, say, to deal with uh, a panchayat level problems. But the issues that these peri-urban interface areas face is a uh, very urban problems. And inevitably there is a lot of degradation that happens in this space. So what are the main problems you face? You have waste management as a huge issue. You see all kinds of uh, waste dumps piled around in this area. You have degraded lakes in almost all these, uh, uh, in this ring around the cities. So this ecological footprint of the city that is extending into these peri-urban areas and also to an extent into the rural has not been favorable for the environment of these places. But what we need again is uh, the acceptance and the understanding that cities are always going to expand and there's going to be this dynamic space where you will probably have to have a, a different kind of governance that is able to incorporate the urban and the rural uh, needs and build infrastructure accordingly that can support this kind of urbanization. So then it seems uh, to me more of a problem of relationship because it's almost like nobody thinks that they are responsible yeah. for this uh, a no uh, man's land kind no of a place, land yeah. There is, the some, there is some recognition happening of the PUI. It's, it is uh, mentioned maybe in government documents. Now a little more, there is a little more recognition, but a lot more needs to be done because this is how cities are going to be expanding, right. spreading into the neighborhood. Yes. And then is there scope for kind of concentrating cities, like instead of expanding outwards, kind of going up, or uh, other ways of uh, increasing density? So whatever way we imagine cities as uh, dense, packed or spreading out, uh, one thing that we have to be very clear about and have an understanding is of the ecological landscape and the geographical location of the cities when we plan it accordingly. And how do we get uh, people involved in uh, imagining their own city? How do we increase participation of citizens in urban planning? I think uh, one of the things that makes uh, people want to do something for the city is to develop uh, is uh, uh, how they can connect to the city mm. right and uh, the connection will happen if uh, by sparking some interest that they already have so there are different ways maybe i am interested in birding there may be a natural space in my locality in my neighborhood uh, that might be of interest to me uh, someone else may be interested in heritage yeah. so there may be some local temple or a building that could have some story behind it so i think stories narrations these are a great way of making uh, citizens connect with their immediate landscape so that when there is some kind of a threat or a possibility of a threat there is uh, they will invest their time resources and energy to come out and protect it and we have found from our research that history is a great hook Mm. Uh, uh, everybody wants to know, you know, what is the story behind this. It could be a mythical story, it could be folklore, but what it does is generate an interest. Yes. And that is, uh, that is something that we found really makes people come out of their homes, come out of their comfort zone and do something for uh, cities. So to participate in making cities more sustainable, protect biodiversity and value the cities that they are in. So what you're saying is if we want to bring uh, kind of nature back into people's lives, are, are these the ways uh, to do that? Not, not through what we think of as, you know, information or being didactic uh, through textbooks. Nature, you have to touch, feel and experience, yeah. right? So uh, it, it's good to know about mountains and oceans which are distant and forests also which are distant, but it is that lived experience of interacting with nature, being awed by a butterfly or being awed by a plant or a magnificent tree that is going to make me a votary for it, which is yes. going to make me come out and say I want to protect this piece yeah. of uh, nature in the city because I feel something for it. Mm -hmm.
and normally when we talk about you know protecting nature or preserving nature in the city we always associate it with tree planting either uh, trying to cut down trees to widen roads uh, or planting trees uh, to kind of make up for what has happened before the degradation which has happened before so what is your take on this is tree planting the only way to go or there are some other ways we can uh, do this tree planting is definitely good uh it's a nice feeling to plant a tree everybody likes to yes. be associated yes. with having seen a tree planted and grow and become a huge uh, but just like with anything else we need to plan very carefully for tree planting so we need to have an idea about what are the kinds of trees that are there in the city what are the kinds of species that are uh, necessary and useful um where are these trees present uh, which are what is the kind of biodiversity that these trees would like and based on that then we should plan for the entire city find out spaces where you may need uh, new trees planted and also uh, think ahead with tree planting we always have to think like a few years ahead because we're yes. trying to build a canopy for the city yes. and normally we hear that when there are development projects uh, we hear that 60 trees are being uh, cut but we are planting 60000 saplings now that the problem with that is that trees take decades to grow yes. the benefits that a fully grown tree can provide is nothing uh, compared to what even uh, uh, a sapling can provide so we need to take all this into consideration when we are planting and we have to be very careful while planting it so it's not a frivolous exercise or something that has to be done because you have to meet a certain green cover that of the is, city yeah, yeah. Uh, but something that should be done with as much uh, care as you would any kind of infrastructure or service for a city on that note uh, Let's end this episode of Plain Speak. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Seema. And it was really interesting to get your views and Haruni's views Thank on this you. important topic of resilient cities. And I hope you also joined, uh, got a lot out of our discussion. And please join us for the next episode of Plain Speak, which you will find on the Azim Premji University YouTube channel, where you can press the bell icon for more notifications. Thank you.